I let uh, our volunteers, Srini and Sneha, take over, um, and Srini might have collected questions uh, from the chat. Uh, so, Srini, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Swati. So, we do have a lot of interesting questions. In fact, even before the event began, we got lots of questions from the emails. And that just shows how enthusiastic people are to the cause and to the work of uh, Bay Davis. So what we do have is that if you, we, we will be going through the question, but I just wanna also talk about that. If you'd like to like, engage more with aid on any of the projects that we work on, we definitely welcome that. We do have a very strong and diverse volunteer community and working on various issues, not just environment, but also on education, women's empowerment, and other grassroots issues. So if you find any issues close to your heart, we would definitely welcome you to either donate or volunteer to the cause. And I also like to add special thanks to our volunteers, Swati, Santosh, Vedant, Sneha, and Kripa, who put in a lot of effort to make this event happen today. Thank you. So in the interest of time, we have combined some questions, which are of similar nature. And we'll try to address as many questions as possible today. So yes, let's get started with the questions. The first question is from Grazia. And she asks, do you believe a language can exist and develop if the people speaking it do not have governance and control over the territory or seascape where they develop that language? Thank you, Grazia. I mean, that's an interesting question. I mean, you know, you know, it, it's so important to recognize, uh, as I said, language isn't just vocabulary and grammar, which is why the loss of language is so significant. I mean, look, you know, it's not fair to say to that, that you, you lose your language, you no longer have a culture, because that's not true. I mean, there are any number of, um, of uh, indigenous people here in North America who have lost their language, but very, or, or uh, very strongly maintain a sense of culture. And again, the revitalization of languages, those efforts don't necessarily need to imply that, for example, the Haida are going to stop speaking English and speak Haida to each other. But the revitalization of language also is more sends a signal to young people that culture is important. I mean, for example, obviously in India, English um, uh, uh, is one of the one one of the few legacies of the British that that the British actually gave to India as opposed to everything they took from India, and um, but that you know and 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 those who in India uh, may only speak English that hardly means that you're not of the culture of the subcontinent. Um, so so but but the poetry of language is such that you know it really is rooted in landscape and 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 culture is rooted in landscape. You know. Um, culture emerges from a kind of a spirit of place. Um, so, so I think that the answer to that is to simply to say that language is a mu much more multi multifaceted uh, expression of both a, 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 a culture, but also of the human heart. Thank you, Wade. So next question is, I'm gonna combine two questions. One, one from Andrea and other by Sri. So how do the indigenous people throughout South America mix the capitalism with their beliefs? Do they contradict themselves or rather do they complement one another? And also how do the indigenous people preserve their own spiritual beliefs without having to accept organized religions like Christianity? Well, you know, you, you know it sort of depends. I mean, um, you know, pe people, deal with their circumstances adapt through change you know so for example in the andes uh, of south america you, you you really have this kind of fusion of the two worlds and as as much as catholicism was imposed upon pre-columbian ideas the pre-columbian ideas have also transformed catholicism right and you know a friend of mine as i said in my talk nilda kalanaupa um, who's who's an extraordinary indigenous person, a, a dear friend of mine for many years. Uh, I once asked Nilda, what do you feel like when these anthropologists come along and try to separate what in your belief system is from the Catholic tradition versus the, um, uh, the, the pre-Columbian ideas? And she says, it just gives us a headache because we're just, we're all one. 
at the same time in the Northwest Amazon, you know, where, where, where uh, there was a heavy uh, Protestant missionary presence, um, I once asked some elders who had finally kicked out the missionaries, and we asked them, you know, why did you, why did you um, allow these people to stay so long, uh, clearly when they're undercutting the values of your society? And the answer from one elder was very moving. He said, because they promised to make us human. And that's the essence of colonization, is to persuade the colonized of their own inherent inferiority. Look what happened to India. I mean, you know, you know, you know, you know what held the Raj together I, I found it, which it was a sheer audacity, the nerve of the British. I mean, there were never more than 1,300 individuals in the British civil service. When Lord Curzon was asked why there wasn't a single Indian in the civil service, um, he said, because in the entire subcontinent, there wasn't one man up for the job. The, the British never had more than, what, what is it, 50,000 Brits in India. How'd they hold it together? They held it together by a big ruse. Like, you know, Lord Curzon, all those fancy, you know, British pomp and pageantry, they just made that stuff up. You know, Lord Curzon had his uniforms made by theatrical designers in the West End of London. He'd say, oh, I think I need a little bit more braid. In other words, it, in a way, it was just a big show, you know, in, in a sense. And uh, uh, and one of the things that, you know, one of our great Canadian figures, um, one of our chief justices said, uh, in thinking about in the plight of Indigenous people, um, he said, there's only three questions in life. Who am I? Where do I come from? And where am I going? And during the colonial experience, the colonists were essentially saying, the Europeans in all parts of the world, to people that all of your answers for all of your history to all of those questions have been wrong. And so the psychological impact of all of that was very profound in amongst certain indigenous societies. But again, culture can be reborn. I, I um, uh, in, in the case of the Northwest Amazon of Colombia, a Colombian president empowered a friend of mine who became minister of indigenous affairs he said, you know, do something for the Indians. And in five years, Martin did more than something. He got, he secured legal land tenure for an area of land collectively the size of the United Kingdom for the peoples of the Northwest Amazon. And behind a veil of isolation created by the absence of the nation state, a whole new dream of culture was reborn. And when we went to make a film there, a friend of mine, Stephen Hugh Jones, head of anthropology at Cambridge, who in the 19, late 60s had been part of a BBC film sadly predicting the demise, the cultural exhaustion of those societies, the disappearance of the peoples. He, he walked in halfway through our production and saw this longhouse full of 250 men and women in ritual regalia doing this amazing event. And he couldn't help himself. He rushed out to the satellite phone and he called his wife in London and said, Christine, you won't believe my eyes. The only thing that actually disappeared were the bloody missionaries, you know. So in other words, you know, it's not as if culture can't be reborn. And, and this is really important. You know, we're not asking. It's not about the traditional versus the modern. It's about the rights of free people to choose the components of their lives. It's not about, you know, sequestering people in the past and, 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 or, or, or limiting anyone from the brilliance of the present science and so on. It's, it's how do we find a way that all peoples of the world can benefit from the best of science without that engagement demanding the death of who they are as a people. And by the same token, how can we learn uh, from lessons, from other ways of thinking? I mean, this is where, you know, I wrote a book called The Wayfinders, which an uh, editor put on a snappy title. And I think this is a really important point to make in this conversation about climate change. Uh, and the subtitle was Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World. Now, I didn't like the title because, of course, it suggested that these various cultures are somehow vestigial when they're not. They're living dynamic peoples. But the question forced me to answer it. And, uh, and I answered it in two words, climate change. Again, not to suggest that any of us go back to some kind of pre-industrial past or anyone be kept from the best of the contemporary world, but critically, the recognition and the realization of all that there are these all other ways of thinking that our way is not the only way puts a lie to those of us in this industrial Western paradigm who essentially say that we cannot change as we all know we must change the fundamental way in which we inhabit the planet. 
And, you know, this is a process of change. I mean, you know, one, one important point, I think, in relation to your work at aid is that, you know, people might say, okay, they're just doing a little small thing here, small thing there. No, um, you know, it, 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 will it do any good? Well, first of all, one lesson I learned from my father, who was not a Christian, he wasn't even a religious man, but he was a decent man and a good man and an ethical man. And he said, look, there's good and evil in the world, son. Take your pick and get on with it. And that was actually a very wise statement because one of the illusions of Western religious beliefs, particularly Christianity, is this kind of dichotomy between good and evil, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, and we have this fantasy that the Christ child will eventually beat the fallen angel, the devil, right? And, and the world's all going to be wonderful and good. Well, you know, you know, ain't going to happen. And the wonderful thing about the intuitions of, 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 of the Vedic scriptures is that they never expect it to happen, nor does the Buddhist lineage. In other words, you know, there's a famous, you know, if you were uh, in the European tradition, if you ask the obvious question, uh, if God's all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the universe? If you ask that question in Europe in the year 1400, you were burned at the stake as a heretic. But when Lord Krishna was asked that same question. If God's all powerful, why does he allow evil to exist in the universe? Lord Krishna said to thicken the plot. In other words, in other words, this is the nature of life and that's a whole Dharma. I mean, so I say to young people, you've got to recognize that life is not a, geared to a destination. It's a process. It's like the path of the pilgrim. It's not to get to a destination. It's to cultivate a state of mind. And people often ask me, I'm 66, how can I have this energy? How can I have this idealism still be? It's because I don't expect to win. I may win some things, I may lose something. It doesn't matter. The goal is to make your pick, as my father said, and then get on with it. And so if you just embrace the quest for the good, and we all know what that is in every culture, you know, I mean, you know, and we all know what what is what is the darker angels of our nature versus the light, the white, you know, get on with it and don't expect to win. And that way, when you realize that the path of righteousness is simply the path of existence, then you never stop and you never get discouraged and you never get bitter. Right. Be, and, 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 and that's so important. And, it, you know, it, it's important to say, too, that one of the wonderful things about cultures is both the differences of beliefs that I've emphasized, but also our commonality. You know, all human beings face the same adaptive imperatives. We all have children, we have to feed and look after and educate those children. We have to come together in marriage or to couple in some way that is consistent. Uh, marriage rules can differ, but the, uh, the rules within any culture have to be consistent. We have to deal with the agony of growing old. We have to deal with the inexorable separation that death represents in the mystery that death implies. And what's so fascinating about the human adaptation is that given that commonality, so many different blossoms have, have, have bloomed in the garden of the human imagination. Beautiful, profound. The next question is from Eva. And it's more of a personal question. She's one of the people who tried to reach, reach out to us even before they even began. And she says, my mother was a descendant from the Jogi tribe in Colombia. And my brother and I are the only half Jogis living in Montreal, Canada. Hmm. Would you know of any other Jogis in Canada? And with all your travels and experience, I'm curious to know if you have ever helped connect people. Um, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's funny. I, um, I'm... Um, uh, very close to the um, the communities of the Sierra, but my main liaison, my main contact is through the Arawakos as opposed to the Kogi, although I, I knew many Kogi um, mammals. Um, I don't know others in um, in Canada per se. I, um, I, I, I often was, when I was with President Santos visiting Namasimake, the main community of the Arawakos, uh, he introduced me and he, he is very generously, but as he was speaking of me, he was interrupted by one of the elders who said, you don't have to tell us about him. He's our ambassador in Washington. And truly, 
uh, when we lived in Washington, our home was was a place where the delegations would stay. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that I don't know of others. But you know, I've got lots of networks. If they want to uh, email me, I'll, I'll be able to put them in touch with people that could help that question. Sounds good. Hey, thanks, Eva, for the question. Next one is from Scott Walker. And he says, I've been reading your work and I also teach human geography with your media. However, you portray a bleak and hopeless picture that is so large that the demise of ethnosphere cannot be overcome, especially with, by the individual, thus people tend to give up. What would you offer as solutions for the individual US college students or for any individual for that matter? Well, well, I think first of all, I, I, I suggest patience. You know, um, you know, history is a lot uh, is both a deep current and a long race. You know, um, uh, I people often af ask me if I'm optimistic, and I, I respond, you know, I'm by definition optimistic because I'm a father, and also I sort of think pessimism is an indulgence, just like despair is an insult to the imagination. Orthodoxy is the enemy of invention. Uh, you know, in my lifetime, um, women have gone in North America from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, um, gay people from the closet to the altar. Uh, when I was a, a young boy, just getting people to stop throwing garbage out of a window was con considered an environmental victory. Nobody spoke about the biosphere or biodiversity. Now those terms are part of the language of children. The year I was born, there wasn't a government in the world that had a ministry of the environment. Now there is not one that does not have a ministry of, of the environment. You know, uh, when I was a boy, the air in cities in North America could not be breathed. Uh, uh, in, in cities like Pittsburgh, uh, the street lights had to be kept on all day because of the smoke and fog. Uh, rivers would catch fire as they did in Ohio. Uh, the Hudson River outside of New York, it was said that you could tell what kind of car General Motors was making in its plant at Terrytown by the color of the river. Uh, the River Thames in 1967, when I was 14 uh, or 13 years old, uh, was declared biologically dead by the Natural History Museum. Today, there are 125 species of fish in that river. One of the great messages of COVID was the evidence of the resilience of the earth. As the industrial world shut down, nature rebounded. We suddenly saw canals in Venice clear. We saw rivers in Colombia running like brook, like trout streams through major cities. We saw the wetlands around Mumbai populated by tens of thousands of birds. We saw the skies over uh, Kathmandu and Delhi suddenly clear and the white peaks of the Himalaya uh, shining over the uh, uh, India in ways that hadn't been seen for generations. We saw wild boar in the streets of Barcelona, Caiman blackening the beaches of Baja. You know, we saw the resilience of the world. You know, again, it, you know, is remember humility if you took the entire presence of the human species on earth, not just Homo sapiens, but going back, not just to our progenitor Homo erectus, but all the way back 3.5 million years to Homo afarensis, uh, and you took that whole lineage and put it on a 24-hour 24 24 clock that represented the history of planet earth, that entire 3.5 million year presence of human lineage would not occupy a second of the 24 hours. So our presence has been astonishingly fleeting. We've achieved great things, we've done great destruction, but as long as we continue to push the wheel of hope, uh, the world will, and we will have a chance. Remember that it is only uh, in 1968 that we saw, first saw the vision of Earth from space, that crystal moment of awareness when Apollo went around the dark side of the moon um, and revealed not a limitless horizon, but a very fragile, small blue planet, as the astronauts famously said, floating in the velvet void of space. And that image will be spoken about 50,000 years from now. And 
by the same token, the second lesson of science also brought back to us by, by an extraordinary scientific journey, but a journey not in the space, but in the fiber of our beings. And this is a lesson of genetics that I referred to in my talk. This lesson has yet to seep into the zeitgeist, but it is going to, and it will be the final death of racism. It will be. I mean, only an idiot's going to be able to maintain the fantasy that such a thing as race exists. And yet this is, it's just, we just have to be patient. And in the end, we will get there. Nice. Next one is on what books would you recommend in general for people starting with anthropology or indigenous wisdom? And let me also add a question on, we also have seen an increased focus upon, at least in developing nations, on STEM degrees, which are the science, technology, engineering, and maths. So how can common people also get more passionate and involved in humanities and anthropology? Well, well, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, when I went through anthropology at Harvard, I got very good grades, but I graduated not understanding a thing about it, right? And one of the problems is I think the lessons of anthropology are hard to assimilate when you're young, perhaps, but also it's not necessarily taught in a very engaging way. Um, and so when I did the little book, the Massey Lectures, uh, uh, it was a CBC Massey Lectures, which is this big lecture series in Canada. The books get published and it was the Wayfinders. And I honestly, I use that in my own introductory courses uh, at UBC. And, I, and it was my attempt to write to the public as to why anthropology matters. Um, and, and, you know, the, Ruth Benedict, the great student of Franz Boas, said the entire purpose of anthropology is to make the world safe for human differences. Now, let me, let me, let me give you a, an example of why anthropology counts. Okay, if you, if you for example, um, look back to the lifetime in Europe or in India, for that matter, of your grandparents, say, before World War I, if you look at, say, for example, how my grandfather would have thought uh, growing up before World War I, um, his attitudes about um, the relationship between men and women, his attitudes about the natural world, his attitudes about homosexuality, whatever, not one of his certitudes would I embrace today. And in fact, most of them I would see to be morally reprehensible. In 1911, the English Oxford Dictionary did not have an entry for the term racism because the superiority of the white man was accepted with such assurance. It had no entry for colonialism. It had no entry for homosexuality. Now, when we look at what I just referenced, um, the, the changing role of women, changing attitudes towards gender, changing attitudes towards race, we tend to think of these as the consequence of social movements, and they have been. But you forget that something had to come along to, sh to challenge the certitudes of my grandfather. Something had to come along intellectually and scientifically to suggest that those certitudes were false. And that was anthropology. It was this small group of contrarians, largely in the United States around the Museum of Natural History, led by Franz Boas, who had the audacity in the 1920s and 30s, uh, and before that, in the case of Boas himself, to say that race is a total social construct. It's a fiction. Who had the audacity to say that a family could be made up of a man and two women, two men, uh, two women and a man, it could be made up of two women. It could be made up that all that matters for a family is there to be love in the household. You know, who came along and, and said um, uh, uh, any number of things, right, that shattered the European certitude. So, for example, if you think today, living in the United States, as many of you do, that it's completely normal that a young woman from India has a boyfriend or even a husband from Ireland. Or if you think it's quite normal that you know two men from, from wherever who live together as a married couple and happen to be homosexual. If you think that's normal, if you think you can understand what it meant when that young American woman 
um, uh, pointed to her skin and said, look at me. And of course she was African-American, but she was, her light skin said, as she pronounced, my skin tells you that my, my great, 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 great grandmother was raped on a plantation by a white overseer. I am the statue of the Confederacy, not that damn thing we just pulled down. I'm the statue of the Confederacy you have to deal with. If you understand those things, you are a child of anthropology. Anthropology transformed the world. And that's why Boaz ranks with Darwin, Einstein, and Freud as one of the four pillars of modern intellectual thought in the West. Thanks a lot, Dave. So we do have time for a few more questions. And so some of our grassroots partners in India believe that the pandemic has undone a lot of progress in terms of women empowerment, the literacy, poverty made in the past few decades in different regions of the country. And we'd like to share your thoughts on the impact it's also having on developing nations like India. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, no, I'm no expert on that. And you, you all know more uh, about that than I do. I mean, I think, you know, I think COVID has, um, um, you know, we, I don't think we really know the impact of COVID yet. You know, I think um, certainly uh, I, 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 one can predict, for example, that the, the ease of working from home uh, is not going to go away when we can congregate in offices again in urban centers. Uh, um, uh, you know, the, the grotesque inefficiencies of the modern commuting life, um, you know, people I don't think are going to willingly go back to that. The costs of maintaining a brick and mortar uh, central space, you know, I mean, I mean, in order to house a, a, a worker bee, if you will, in a glass tower in Manhattan, in New York, um, just a cubicle, you know, costs an employer um, $10,000 a year in terms of the square footage and the rent and so on. I don't, th I don't think that's ever going to um, go back. I think, I think the nature of entertainment, I think it'll be a, a long time in the West between people before people flock to uh, spaces where strangers gather. Even if we're all vaccinated, I still think there'll be a hesit a, a reluctance to gather as we once did in either a dark movie theater or a, a rock and roll concert or whatever. Maybe I'm wrong on that. But I mean, those sorts of adaptations are trivial, really. I mean, you know, we, 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 uh, um, we, we um, you know, human beings are completely uh, you know, fluidity of memory and our capacity to forget is our most compelling trait of character. We, we, we can adapt to any degree of environmental or moral degradation as history sadly says. I think COVID has exposed, as I, I wrote in a piece in Rolling Stone that might be of interest to people that went uh, seriously viral. It came out in August and uh, it trended on the Rolling Stone site for uh, five weeks, which was unusual for a long essay. It was read on the site by 5 million people and it generated as of two months ago, 362 million social media impressions. Uh, it went seriously viral. Um, visits to my Wikipedia site soared from about 150 a day to 4,000. It just had this impact. And the argument of that piece was less about those sorts of impressions of, of COVID than what it's told us about the, um, in a sense, the unraveling of the American uh, dream. In it. So it was, it was sort of a cultural story on COVID. I mean, obviously, the, you know, I think we haven't begun to see the uh, economic impacts. I can't speak for India, but even here in Canada, you know, we, the, you know, the, the 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 economy both in the United States and Canada has been absolutely artificially propped up um, by by enormous government subsidies, which I understand have also occurred in India, and obviously governments can't continue to print money. So, um, where this is going to lead us, one only hopes that if there'll be one uh, solid lesson. Um, in all of this, it's going to be the realization that we are all susceptible. We're all interconnected biological beings living on a finite planet. You know, it's humbling to think that a single microorganism, 10,000 times smaller than a grain of salt, not only 
um, commandeered our fundamental biology, causing our own cells to reproduce it, not them. But also COVID uh, attacked and destroyed um, the bonds of community and, um, and, uh, and, and, and cooperation and engagement that, and reciprocity and exchange that are for the human what teeth and claws represent to the tiger. I mean, for a social species, um, the, 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 what, what, what our fundamental strength is the strength of community and, uh, and our, our collective uh, uh, essence, right? And so for, to have family members torn from family members, I mean, we went through this last week where my mother-in-law passed away in an old folks home in California and my, my wife had no way to reach and see her beloved mother because the American frontier is closed and the quarantines and so on. But um, hopefully if we can remember coming out of this, that we're all susceptible and that we all truly share with each other a, a very finite uh, world. Uh, maybe some good will come out of the tragedy. And I'm sorry to hear that too. Yeah. Uh, just the next one is on, on a new book, which is the Magdalena River of Dreams. So can you talk about the, exp the experiences that inspired this particular book? Oh, well, you know, uh, well, a couple of things. I mean, I think everybody falls in love with the first country that captures their hearts and gives them license to be free. And for me, it was Colombia. You know, my mother uh, was a modest but um, determined Canadian woman, and we were from a very humble background, but um, she saved all year long to allow me to join a group of schoolboys that a teacher was taking to Colombia in 1968. And at a time when most Canadians had never been in an airplane, um, the South American destination was very exotic. And I was the youngest of all these students and the most fortunate because I was billeted by with a modest family, not a wealthy family up in the mountains. I never saw the other Canadians and uh, many of them much older than I uh, succumbed to what the Colombians call mamitis, which is homesickness. And I, by contrast, felt like I had finally found home. And there was just something about Latin culture that I, I just found enchanting and wonderful. And then I returned there as a young student and so on. And I ended up writing a, a couple of books that became for two generations of young students who were unable to travel because of the violence, um, kind of maps of dreams, you know. And one of the things about writing books, Hemingway said that anyone who th thinks that writing is easy is either a bad writer or a liar. And I've always had to have some sense of passion, um, uh, some mission in a way when I write a book, you know, especially a book that takes a number of years. And for me, the mission clearly was the injustice of the violence that had been laid upon Colombia by the international consumption of cocaine. You know, it's just extraordinary to think about it. Most Colombians have never seen, let alone use cocaine. Uh, in a country of 50 million, the combatants in the war never numbered more than 200,000. Most Colombians were just caught in the vice of war, a war that would not have lasted for a day, let alone 50 years, if it had not been for cocaine. Um, you know, at the height of the cocaine cartel with the Americans spending, you know, billions of dollars a year to, to try to fight it, uh, the Medellin cartel was putting 80 tons of cocaine into America every month. Uh, accountants were budgeting in Medellin $1,000 a week just to buy elastic bands. Um, and uh, in the last year of the war, the FARC leftist guerrillas, who were as responsible for atrocities as a, uh, not as responsible, but also responsible, uh, the paramilitaries, the forces of the right, uh, were responsible for perhaps 80% of the killings. But the, the point is that the FARC made, uh, they were down to 6,000 cadre, mostly young kids in search of a meal, but they made $600 million from um, uh, trafficking. Uh, so if you give me, you know, the Bombay or Mumbai rather, Boy Scouts and $600 million, I can wreak havoc in most of India, right? So it was a cocaine that was a fuel of the war. And so you had this um, uh, uh, incredible situation where uh, uh, you, you know, imagine if, if Canada, uh, it, it was patterns of consumption of cocaine in bars and boardrooms across the world that were were responsible for the blood that was on, that was 
that was being spilled in in Colombia. You know, just think about it. You know, um, uh, two hundred twenty thousand dead, a hundred thousand missing, seven million internally displaced, five millions forced to flee the country, um, and yet and yet throughout all those years, Colombia maintained its democracy and civil society, greened its cities, created millions of acres of national parks, sought restitution with indigenous people, and paved the way for um, a kind of renaissance as these hundreds of young people come back uh, to a world at peace um, in the wake uh, from all over the world. And, 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 and the extraordinary thing is that only Colombia could have endured such a nightmare. Can you imagine how the Americans would feel if Canada had patterns of drug consumption and laws that forced 85 million Americans to flee their homes? Well, that's what happened. And I wanted to write a book that told the true story of Colombia that didn't hide away from that dark history, but explained it with empathy even while pointing out that that was one small strand woven through Colombian history. Uh, and that in fact, Colombia was a country of what I call colores y cariño, uh, colors and love that had endured the violence precisely because of their, their, uh, their strength of character um, of both the people and their love of their land, which is in fact the most bountiful on the planet. Uh, Colombia is the richest and most diverse both in terms of biology, but also in terms of ecology and geography of any country on earth. There is no place in Colombia more than a day removed from every ecological niche known to exist on the planet. Uh, it, it, it is second only to Brazil in terms of biodiversity. And of course, Brazil is a much larger country. So the truth about Colombia is that it is an extraordinarily rich culture. And the best way to tell that story was through the biography in the sense of its major river, the kind of Mississippi or the Ganga of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of Colombia. Um, and, and of course, that river that runs south to north, the length of the country in South America is both a corridor of commerce, but a fountain of culture, the repository of, of, um, of literature, poetry, prayer, and music. Colombia is said to be the land of a thousand rhythms, actually, uh, ethnomusicologists have identified 1,025 distinct rhythms in Colombia. And if you go to the internet, you'll find that 85 of the top 100 YouTube videos are music videos, and of those, about a dozen are Colombian. So I, I wanted to, you know, tell the story about a country that had made my life possible. And the book becomes, in a sense, as my friend Hector Abad said, a love letter to the nation. Um, and it was all part of the process and, and, and which culminated, I suppose, in my being very generously offered honorary Colombian citizenship by the Nobel Laureate for Peace, Juan Manuel Santos, uh, which is something that doesn't happen very often in Colombia. Amazing. I'm, I'm very excited to pick up this new book. So with that, we can conclude the question and answer session because we do have a lot of questions, but we are already 15 minutes past our even time. So a wonderful way. It was really a pleasure talking to you and we all just leave with a very renewed perspective. And we want to instill a lot more big changes with this new perspective. So thanks a lot again. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to everybody for supporting aid. <laughs>